Thank you. Uh, yeah, take notes, please, if you have. Uh, that would be wonderful um, for future reference. And um, I'll be having you do some things. You can do it on your phone or a pad. Uh, the, the quote I have up there from Michael Reeves, Delighting the Trinity. I'm going to read it to you and then I'll pray. He writes, God creates a family and makes people designed for fellowship with each other. As the Father, Son, and Spirit have always known fellowship with each other, so we, in the image of God, are made for fellowship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we embark on this study, I pray that you would give us a clear understanding of this call to community as your people who have been saved out of the darkness and brought into the light and the kingdom of your Son. I ask, Lord, that you would be gracious with our church during this time, that we would not just grow in the wisdom and knowledge of what your word has to say, but that you would, in fact, change our hearts that we might live as a communal people because that's who we are. So we're not asking, Lord, that you change our standing in Christ and in the church, but that you would compel us to live in the standing that we already enjoy. We are thankful that you are a communal God. And because of that, you save us into community, both now and for all eternity, as we enjoy the presence of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the church forever. I ask, Lord, over these next eight weeks that you would give us patience, that when we are pressed or convicted, that we would submit to your word, that we would not fall back into the ways of the culture or maybe how we were trained to think what it means to live a Christian life, but submit to your word first and foremost. And just as we saw Moses by faith submitting in a very difficult time, I pray you would do the same for us. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for being here. Um, I don't know what to say after two and a half years of study and research and writing. What I don't want to do is I don't want to download that in these next eight weeks. I don't think that'll be productive. So I've tried really hard to hone it down, to hone it down to the essential truths of what has really convicted me over the past couple years in these studies. And by God's grace, it will have its right impact. And that is not just to grow in the wisdom and knowledge of biblical community, but to become a community. Um, You know, this class can go well. We can take the, for those of you who took the pre-assessment, thank you. Um, I pray that you'll be able to stay the eight weeks. If you can't be here, we're gonna record it, send it out on Mondays. Um, You do need to have all the eight weeks in, minimally seven, I gotta verify that, to take the post survey. Um, I, obviously, I would like the results to be positive for the doctoral thesis, but <laughs> my desire is that if, if that fails and we become the community that we see in Scripture, then it was a success. It's that simple. Um, so it, we, it will be recorded. We'll try to send it out tomorrow, I hope. We are going to try to start on time at 1.30. I will try to close up between 2.30 and 2.45 latest. And so I'm going to try to move through things probably more quickly than you would like. I do want discussion. I do want Q&A. If you can, try to keep your, your, when you discuss something or offer something, try to keep it concise. If someone has already said it, then try not to repeat it. If it's a question that we're going to get to, then I'll tell you to hold off. If it's a really long Q&A, then I'll say, let's talk at another time. Okay? What we're probably going to do is after I have a really tight time frame that I'm on, for the, for the project itself, which means I only have about eight weeks, maybe nine max. We'll probably circle back next year and, and do some deeper digging and do some more Q&A. So if you're a bit frustrated at the end of this, we'll come back to it, don't be. Um, so why community? In 2006, I started pastoring in 2002. In 2006, one thing that the church saw is that we were operating more as individual Christians that gather here rather than as a community of believers living as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we spent about a year developing a new constitution with a covenant membership. That went into place in 2007. So that was 13 years ago. Now I was young enough and foolish enough in the pastor to think that once we got the covenant membership in place, we were gonna have instant community, or at least within a year, maybe two, maybe five. 
13 years in, I think we still struggle significantly with biblical community. And it doesn't mean that we don't do it, but when we read scripture and we see what we're called to, I think that there's still a struggle here for us. And so when we were asked in the doctoral program to identify issues or struggles in our church that we really want to focus on, this kept coming up to the top. I had a list of 10, then it got to five, then it got to three, and this one popped to the top every time. And I think it's been on my mind for about 20 years. And so I'm very thankful that I've had a lot of time to study, to meditate on it, and to write on it. Um, And again, my hope is that that will bless us as a church that we'll, we will see substantive change in how we relate to God and to one another as a people. Um, every week I'm gonna talk to you about some of the books that I've read. So I'll give you eight books in eight weeks. Um, this one, The Compelling Community by Mark Dever and Jamie Dunlop, we've done briefly sections of it, fantastic. Um, it basically deals with how a community is the be- a biblical community, a local church, is the best testimony to the gospel of grace to a lost world. And so I strongly encourage you, you can come up and take a look afterwards or take some pictures of it for those of you who wanna get on Amazon. Um, all right, I've already done this, go to the next slide. See, you gotta tell me if I'm not moving through. Isn't that nice, you like the people? Okay, next slide. Okay, <laughs> seminar one, introduction, biblical foundations. So today we're gonna introduce it, yes. Oh yeah. Uh, Can I move the whiteboard or not, Brandon? Uh, We're trying to be smart recording-wise, too. So can you? I know. I know. I'm not going to use that much. Just try to, don't worry about, don't worry about the, uh, I'll send out the PowerPoint with the recording, Brandon, so maybe more. Is that that better? We okay now? Okay, good. Um, So today I'd like to do introduction, and I'd like to, Uh, do our first passage, and I'll explain the order of operation in a bit. Uh, But before we do that, I want to do something called predicting. And predicting is a way that we actually can gather information mnemonically and store it a little bit better. And that's having you work through an idea first before I teach to it. So next slide, please. Um, If you would for me, either tell me briefly what authentic biblical community is, or give me adjectives that you would use to describe it. Yeah. Family. Family. Ooh. You're just going to go right out of the gate. I'd say that's a home run. Family, you can't get much better than that. Of all the descriptives used for the church, it's probably the best. What else? Supportive. Supportive. Good. Discipling, in the family, authentic community. Good, keep going. Trust. Trust. Accountability. Accountability. Boy, you just are, uh, <laughs> Maddie, going to the mat here. Family accountability. Next one. So we need Holy Spirit. Yes, good. If it's authentic biblical community, we need the Holy Spirit, the grace of the Holy Spirit. Andrea? Hospitality, man. Good. Oh, my. Have you guys read all the same books? Yeah, that's a huge one. Where do I fit? Who is my family? What else? These are great, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So we're, well, I'm just going to keep it simple. We are to pray for one another, right? You're going to be praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't? One body. So to, to live, to interact, to intercede, to relate as one body in Christ. Encouragement. Good. What's that? Service. Service. Serve one another. We're going to look at quite a few of the hospitality or the uh, mutuality commands at the end. 
patience. Yeah, you could actually go through all the fruit of the Spirit, what you would want to see in authentic community. Let me give you, these are excellent. We could add to it, right? It could be really long. Um, let me give you a few definitions that I picked up. You're probably, I don't know if you're going to be able to read this or not. Next slide, please. I'll read them too. No, that's horrible. So just listen. This is from the Compelling Community, Dever and Dunlop. They're just things that they're words of these definitions that really struck me as being more fundamental. Dever or Dunlop, whoever wrote this sentence, I don't know. He said, a togetherness describing authentic community, a togetherness and commitment we experience that transcends all natural bonds because of our commonality in Jesus Christ. A biblical community where, listen to this, our identity no longer stems from our families or of origin or professions or interests or ambitions, but the fact that we are in Christ. That's good. We're, and we're going to get to all these in detail. I'm just trying to give you a flavor of what this is all about. Robert Weber, in his book, Ancient Future Faith, he described it like this. An alternative community to the society of the world this new community, the embodied experience of God's kingdom, so the kingdom on earth being experienced by God's people will draw people into itself and nurture them in the faith. So a completely alternative community than any other community you can know and enjoy in the world. Uh, Michael Reeves again, delighting in the Trinity, he said a community where God unites us to the Son so that together we cry Abba, and begin to know each other truly as brothers and sisters. For the new humanity is a new family. It is the spreading of the Father. And so that we come together in Christ as brothers and sisters, and in so doing, the way we live, the Father goes out. Last one, Von Gelder writes, a social community, a community made up of people who are reconciled with God and one another, to be the church is to be in reconciled relationship. To be the church is to be in active fellowship. To be the church is to live in interdependence with others. So we cannot live apart from one another. Next slide. This is my favorite. Thank you for laughing. So what I try to do is I try to distill some key points on authentic community that led to my writing. Authentic biblical community is God's prescribed family. So that's really important. I just want to pause for a minute. What God has written in his word describes the family of God. And that's why Maddie's response was so good. First and foremost, when you think community in the church, you should be thinking family. Brothers and sisters, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles in the body of Christ. And that is prescribed by God and ordained by God. So authentic biblical community is God's prescribed family. Saints, meaning what? Saved by grace, sanctified in Christ, reconciled with God the Father and one another. Saints committed to living interdependent, interconnected lives. So we are dependent upon one another and we are connected one to another. And we're going to see that next week when we get to 1 Corinthians 12. Saints committed to living interdependent, interconnected lives for the sanctification and preservation of God's people. So we do that so that we become holy as Christ is holy. And so we what? As we saw from Hebrews 2, Hebrews 3, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, so that we what? We make it to the end. So we preserve our souls. So we are saints committed in living interdependent, interconnected lives for the sanctification and preservation of God's people as a gospel witness to the world. When we live like that, the world sees it and they see God and ultimately for the glorification of Christ. We are his what? We are his body. He is the head of the church. So for the ultimate glorification of God. And so my hope is that when you hear community, or biblical community, it doesn't throw you off into a socialistic Marxian mindset. It's family. It is collectivism, but nothing like that, which we will look at and hopefully make some really good distinctions. Um, okay. 
A couple things from the survey that might be interesting for you. I'm going to give you some results as we make our, through our next eight weeks to kind of give you a pulse of where we are. To show you how important it is for you in the context of community, one of the questions was, I am satisfied with my, re- my relationships at my local church. 56%, over half of the church, marked that as a three or two or a one, which is not terribly satisfied. Okay? Question I am, or statement, I am satisfied with the level of accountability members have in my life. 64% had three or less. So dissatisfaction with relationships, dissatisfaction for the majority with accountability, and yet 98% of those who took it agreed or strongly agreed that, quote, without community, living the Christian life is difficult. And so we see the, the need for it. The church gets it and says, yes, and that makes sense. I mean, I've been preaching it for 13, 14 years, so I would be shocked if you didn't, but that experiential knowledge or the experiential component is not where we want to be. Um, and I'm, I'm really thankful for the honesty of those who filled that out. Okay, next slide. So why, why should we study this? All right, there, it doesn't you know, say, well, you, you're making us do this because this is part of your doctoral program. That would be a horrible reason, right? I hope that's not why you think we're doing this. Um, I have six reasons. There are several, but there are six major ones that I want us to understand the foundation that's led to this study and this time that I hope culminates in transformation of our church. So first and foremost, the culture. Would you say that the culture that you currently live in is pro-community or anti-community? Anti-community. Words that you would use to describe the culture today. Selfish. Selfish. Divisive. Divisive. Self-centered, autonomous, isolated, remote, almost the opposite of all these, which you've already listed. We live in a, a, a time, especially in the, in the light of the identity politics that we see taking place now, where identity is self only, and therefore the exaltation of self is independent of any community that doesn't feed your self-interest or your own identity. And so I think that we have to recognize that we swim in waters, and we have been, and you can go back, there's great debate on how far you have to go back, but certainly the 1960s was a watershed decade, but I would say the turn of the century, 1900s, is when we started seeing the shift away from collective family, collective church, to me, mine, my own. When you swim in waters like that long enough, what happens? What's that? You forget you're a fish. One of the things that we're going to really struggle with, and I I pray you will submit to God on this, is you're going to go, wait a minute. That violates my rights. That violates my personal autonomy. That is not what God says. And we're going to see that God teaches quite to the contrary of many of the things that we have incorporated and now inculcated in the church. The evangelical church proposes and teaches things that are more in line with the culture than the Bible. Number two, and this is huge. God equips us as his creatures. We are made in whose image? We are in the image of God. Now God we know, and we just did this not too long ago in our, well I guess it was a while ago in our systematic studies. What kind of God do we, do we worship? He is a what? He's a triune God, right? And triune meaning what? Three gods? Some tell me three eternally distinct persons in one Godhead. What do we know about the triune God? He is, he's communal, right? I love, Ravi Zacharias, I love that when he said this, the, the Bible is the only scriptures that teach that God, the triune God is, from God comes unity, diversity, and community in the Trinity, That's beautiful. We have unity in the world. We have diversity in the world. We have community in the world because we serve a triune God. That's who made everything. So our triune God made us in his image. We are Imago Dei. And that means what about us? We are 
you are, whether you live like it or not, you are a communal creature. Remember the, uh, I referenced that series alone, the Netflix series from the pulpit a few weeks back? You know, one of, the, one of the things that people struggle with most, what do you think it was? It was the isolation. I mean, some of them were losing it. And I think that's what was the attraction. We were watching, oh man, that's not good. 40 days, 50 days, talking to themselves, hallucinating. And they weren't eating mushrooms either. They were just alone. So some of them were actually. Hopefully they were good ones. We are your... Michael Reeves used this term, and I don't want to... Yeah, he calls it our Trinitarian ecclesial self. Now that's just a fancy way of saying your identity comes from a triune God in the context of the ecclesia, the called out ones, the community, the church. In other words, you can't even really know yourself independent of knowing the triune God in the context of the church. And we're gonna to get to that. And some of the most brilliant theologians of the last hundred years have made dramatic statements like you cannot know you're saved independent of the community of believers. So said Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And so, Oh, I'm going to get long. I've got to be careful. All right. The culture, we've got to swim against it. Your ontological self, God has equipped you to be communal. That's part of your DNA. Uh, number three, the sanctification process. This is straightforward. We are not made to be self-sanctified. We are made, we are saved, we are brought into the church, we are baptized, we're added to the role so that sanctification can take place. You helping others be sanctified and made holy in God and others helping you. And the great danger is the Christian is, I don't need that help. That statement is self-defeating. They don't know the danger they're in. Number four, we talk about this briefly. We'll get back to it later. The preservation of your soul. This was probably, you say, give me some of the top five pieces. This was it. I, I, I studied this in part selfishly. I want to be saved. I want to make it all the way to the end. And I know I cannot without you. I don't want to be lost on judgment day. And I don't want you to be lost. And the Bible says again and again that the primary means of grace that God uses to preserve his saints is the church. It is the community. We believe that you cannot be lost. But the means of grace that God uses is the body. Uh, number five, the witness is that what I have here? Yeah, the witness. Um, throughout church history, the best witness to the fallen and lost world was the church living in authentic community. Not, this is not diminishing your testimony, you sharing the gospel, you making disciples, but it was historically the church living as the church and the world seeing complete and total strangers from every tribe, tongue, and nation of all ages and ethnic backgrounds, people from different educational backgrounds, financial backgrounds, all living together as what? As family. And it sets the world on edge. And the world cannot understand that. What a great opportunity to say this is Christ. This is the work of the gospel. So as a witness to the world and then lastly and the most important of all is that we want to be a church that lives in authentic community because it is glorifying to God. He made us to glorify him. He saved us to glorify him. He brought us into a community just like this to bring him honor and glory. So if you said, you know what? I don't care about the first five reasons. I hope you do. But the last one, I mean, it's the one that we are to press and strive and work in order to live in a community that God is so pleased with, right? I mean, don't, don't you want to come into his presence and God say, wow, what a community you were in. What a community you participated in. How you blessed your brothers and sisters and how they blessed you. And you say, yes, praise be to you. That's what we want. That's what we want. Um, next slide. So real quick division so you can have an idea of where we're going. I never liked being in a class not knowing where we were going. 
Like where, where are we trying to end up here? Um, eight sessions, maybe nine, depending upon how long we get, if we get long. The first three lessons are gonna be pure exegesis. We're gonna be looking at five passages, and this was hard. I had 13 passages I had to whittle down. I whittled down to like eight, and my supervisor said, you gotta keep going. I got to seven, and he said, you gotta keep going. He got me down to five. He wanted to get me to four, but I said, I can't give up any more. And here's why. You can see that the, the, the attributes of each of these passages I think really speaks to what we need to do, Cambrian Park Baptist Church needs to do to be a better community. Acts chapter two we'll look at today, we're gonna see that an authentic community is a devoted community, devoted to God and to one another. Um, First Corinthians chapter 12, the context of the body, we're gonna see that an authentic community is an interdependent community, meaning I am dependent upon you, you're dependent upon me, and we're dependent upon one another. Uh, The third passage we're going to look at, Ephesians 4, is a building community, how we use our gifts and talents to build one another up. Hebrews chapter 10, which we should be like, you know, we can skip that, pastor, because we know that. We're not going to. It's an essential community in that it preserves the soul. And then the last one, a God-glorifying community, 1 Peter chapter 4, that the ultimate reason is the glorification of God. So the plan is today, next week, and week three to work through these five chunks of material. Um, I hope that much of this is not terribly new to you. I hope that we can tease some things out and have you think about it a little more seriously and by God's grace apply it. But, but we've been teaching and preaching this for years, so this should not be. The last five sections, are. I'm hoping to bring some new stuff to you going, wow, I, I never looked at it like that. I never thought about it like that. I don't know if I agree with that, okay? So these first three weeks, hopefully working through. My, my hope for you is that you will be here. You'll be cognizant. You'll try to stay awake after you just had a big meal. Um, and if you miss this time, that you'll, you'll watch it during the week. Um, again, I, I, I need you to watch it in order to have you take the survey. And I don't want you to miss anything. I don't want you to miss anything. Uh, the end goal being us practicing community better than we did before. Any questions up to this point? No questions? Is it clear? Yeah, all right, you have, some of you had that eye, that look in your eye, I know that look. That's the warm belly look. All right, um, next slide please. So here was a, a thesis statement on the biblical mandate that's, that comes from section one, from all the study of these five passages, this was, this was the biblical mandate that came out of it. If the spiritual maturity, and we can add to that preservation, but if the spiritual maturity and testimony of a local church requires authentic community, if that's true, and such communities are clearly revealed in the Bible, if that's true, then the pursuit of authentic community must be a priority for every local church. I'm arguing it's not optional. If our spiritual maturation, if the preservation of our souls and the testimony of the world is contingent upon an authentic community, then it's not optional for, not, for us not to pursue it. In fact, I would say any church that says it's not that important or it's not important at all is arguing something contrary to God's word itself. So that's kind of the premise that we're starting from, that it is, this is an essential means of grace given by God for us, for the world, and for his glory. And so I wanna, I wanna start off by looking at, you, you could not do this study without looking at Acts chapter two. I mean, you could not, right? And so let's, uh, next slide, please. If you, ha- you know what, open up your Bibles. That's, uh, I don't like the way that looks. Open up to Acts chapter two, please. Let's take a look at this devoted community. Acts chapter two, I'm gonna begin reading at verse 42 and work through 47. We're gonna focus just on verse 42 today and then the rest will play out as you'll see. So come on, give me a quick context to where we are. Acts chapter two, what's just happened? What's happened, Dylan? Before that, what did Peter do? He preached the gospel. He preached the gospel. The spirit of the Holy Spirit is poured out on the people 
you have 3,000 coming to a saving grace that day. This is the result. Instant community. Listen. All those who came to a saving grace. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Verse 43. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Verse 46, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day day by day those who were being saved. When you hear that, what's the initial response to that movement? It's exciting. What is your response? You hear that and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. All right. What do you, what, what, what's your visceral response to that? Convicting. Convicting. Mm, Aaron. Uh, the modern church is a far cry. Far cry. Yeah. The distance. Good. Attractive. Attractive. Is it not? You say, I, I want to be in that church. Pastor. Yeah. This is the beginning of the church. What you cannot do, now listen closely. You cannot say this was an aberration. You cannot conclude this was an historical anomaly. Only the church in Jerusalem that received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost received this type of power and lived like this. That would be a contextual lie. We would argue that this is the expectation of a spirit-filled church in Christ for all time. And so the hope would be, Christine, as you said, great excitement, and hey, that can be us too. That can be us too. So the question is, how? If we're not, then how? If we can be, how do we get there? Next slide. Now, you'll probably find it interesting, of all the words that I landed on in the study, it was devoted. That's the word. Now, the rest is going to play out from that, but I really think that's the central piece of this section. Verse 1, again, it says, they devoted themselves, they, the church, filled by the Holy Spirit, responding to the gospel, they devoted themselves to four things. What were they? Do you remember? Apostolic teaching. Breaking of bread. Prayer. Fellowship. We'll talk about each of those briefly. But before we do that, we need to talk about the word devotion. Can someone give me, actually all of you do this. Take a minute right now in your head or you can, if you're like my mom, man, you're taking a lot of notes. I hope that's good stuff. Um, Identify someone or something you're devoted to. Number two, what are some of the characteristics of that devotion? What does it look like? And number three, how does your devotion impact the way you relate to that person or thing? All right? Think of someone or something you're devoted to. What are the characteristics of that devotion? And how does that shape that relationship? Take a minute, and then we'll, we'll discuss it. All right, let's start with the first one. Someone or something, and listen, you can be rightly devoted to something, right? There's there's nothing wrong with you being devoted to your job. In fact, I would argue that's biblical. If you're inordinately devoted, then it would be bad. So give me some things you're devoted to. Just throw them out, Debbie. Grandkids. Grandkids. Kids. Kids. Spouse. Spouse. You better say that, Brand. All right. (laughs) Spouse, 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 spouse. Good. I like how you're focusing on family. 
Broaden that up a little bit. Dog. Dog. <laughs> Not that far. Yes, all right. Dog, just don't say cat. Please, don't. Don't say cat. Okay, cat. School? Aaron? Ministry. What else? Father. Parents. Fifth commandment. Honor. Good. Bible reading. Eating the word of God. Good. Prayer. The Lord. Somebody going to say church? <laughs> Please, somebody say church. <laughs> Please. Brothers and sisters in Christ. You. I'm devoted to you. Sarah. Sarah. You were. That a girl. Okay. Some of the characteristics. Tell me what they are. Give me some characteristics of these devotions. So think about what you said and how is that, what characteristic comes from that? Debbie. Good. Commitment. We already said that up here, right? We did have that. Commitment. Loyalty. You're loyal to that person or that thing, right? Good. Pastor? Affection. Affection. How will that affection be shown depending upon what it is? Maybe I love you. It may be hugs. It may be affection through feeding, right? Emotional investment. Ooh. Can you expand on that a little bit? Good. So there's emotional investment in those people or things we're devoted to. Right? If a stranger on the street, you know, says something vile to you, I mean, that's probably not, you're not going to go, oh, that was so great, thank you. It's going to bother you, right? But if your spouse or your child or your grandchild said it, there's investment there and you're going to be hurt by it, right? Good. Kid. Sacrifice. Ooh, see now you're, you're getting into the next one, but that's all right. I like. Sacrifice. Adam. If it is a, if there is true devotion, then trust is implicit. In fact, we're going to look at that, how important it is to have trust in the body of Christ. Yazzie. Huh. Good. Being present. Good. Okay, so the relationship then, if you think of the third category, how does your devotion impact the way you relate? <coughs> Some of these you've already, listen, so you're going to be consistent in that relationship. There are going to be sacrifice in the relationship. Add to this list how it will actually impact the way you relate to that person. Yazzie. Good. If you don't work at it, you're not really devoted to it. I mean, right? If you say, I'm really committed to getting straight A's, but I'm not going to do homework. Well, you're really not devoted to it. Somebody had a hand up. Sonia? Yeah, other centered? Agreed. So that's, if you're devoted to someone... One of the ways that will manifest is you will be thinking about, praying about, interested in their well-being. And even interested in things that you're not interested in at all. Husbands and wives always smile at this, right? They're like, yeah. And now you have that list would be like, we have fill both sides of the board, right? But because you're devoted to your husband or your wife, those interests become your interests. Because you love them. Kirk. Good. Good. Okay, so go ahead, Brent. I was just going to say, Jamie, persevere when it's hard. I think you're really tough not giving up. 
So if we're going to persevere, you guys, you guys have a really good idea of devotion. You got it, right? The word that's used here, go to the next slide, please. So, here, so here's my thesis thought on Acts 2, that the early church in Jerusalem was devoted to a way of life that cultivated authentic community. They were devoted to a way of living that produced authentic community. They didn't say to themselves, let's be an authentic community. They v- devoted themselves to a way of life that brought that about. And so it was the result of their relationship with God and with one another. Um, I lo- this was my favorite definition. It's not a formal definition, but Richard Longnecker, he, this was his definition in his commentary. The verb denoted here connotes a steadfast, listen to this, in the context of your relationship to the church. Devoted connotes a steadfast and single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. Steadfast, single-minded in your relationship to your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And then David Peterson wrote this. He said, it implies that the church in Jerusalem was a model, and I would agree with that. There's great debate on that, but I think that it's right. It's a model of what could happen when people were bound together by a belief in the gospel. I think that's true, that people who are truly bound together by the blood of Christ and filled by the Holy Spirit that are gathered into a local body, ordained by God, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, can in fact be just like this. So the excitement can translate into reality. And I would argue because you are made in the image of God and you are a communal creature, that your heart longs for this. Do you ever feel just lonely? And now, now loneliness is going to be part of the human experience on this side of Eden. We got that. But I would argue in the Western world, our loneliness is in large part a product of our isolation. In large part due to the lack of community we enjoy amongst brothers and sisters. So it's a vincible isolation. You can overcome that for many of us. Um, okay, so they were devoted to apostolic teaching. Next slide, please. Apostolic teachings, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This is what they were devoted to. They weren't devoted to authentic community. They were devoted to these four things and what came out? Authentic community. Right, so I, it's really important from the onset, I don't want you thinking, how do we become a more authentic communal church? We will fail. We want to say, how, am, how do I become more devoted to Christ? How do I become more devoted to my brothers and sisters? What does that look like? If we do that, then community will be the response or the result. It'll be a good consequence of our actions. Okay, so let's go back to uh, verse 42 again. They, the new church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, when you hear the word apostle, you immediately think, because you've had enough good Greek from Pastor Kirk, and Pastor Kurt, you know what? The apostole means what? What is an apostle? Pastor, come on. Sent one, a messenger. Now, it's the messenger's teaching, which means it's not the teaching of men, but the teaching of the one who sent the messenger. Who is? It's God. Right? So when it says they devoted themselves to the apostolic teachings, it means they devoted themselves to what? To God's word. To the word of God. Now the apostles were, were teaching and preaching what would eventually be codified in our Bible. Right? I mean, they were teaching Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the proclamation of the gospel. Matthew 28, 20, the Lord's teachings. 1 Corinthians 15, the plan of redemption. They were teaching God's word. But what made the church, listen, this is really important. John Stott brought this up, and I, I think he was right on. What made the church rightly submissive to the word of God is that they were a spirit-filled church. We usually read, when we read verses 42 to 47, especially the latter part of verse 43, we talk about the wonders and the signs and them being in awe and we say, oh, that was a spirit-filled church. 
what made it a spirit-filled church? And it was not those things. Those things were reflections of the spirit. By the word of God. Stott probably said it better. Do I have a quote from him? He, I do. A spirit-filled church is a New Testament church in the sense that it studies and submits to the New Testament instruction. That's a spirit-filled church. Right? We, we're a little afraid as Reformed Southern Baptists to use that word, spirit-filled. Don't be. We better be or we're in trouble. But it's, it's used in the sense here, they were spirit-filled because they were listening they were understanding and then they were submitting. They were doing what the word of God says to do. Not by force or compulsion, but because they wanted to. So they were devoted to listening. In fact, most of the commentators argue that the primary teaching took place in the temple courts, which means people were what? They were going to church. They were going to church in the temple courts and the apostles would stand up and they would preach and teach and the people would hear and they would understand because the Holy Spirit gave them that understanding and then they would do what the Bible said. How wonderfully simple. Oh, my beloved, if we can stop right there. I can end it right now. Forget the next eight weeks. If we want to be an authentic community, we can simply hear, understand, and submit to the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit and we will become as authentic as it gets. Okay. Okay. Fellowship. I just got to make sure. I don't know what's behind me, so I'm sorry. I, I'm always afraid to put my laptop up here because it'll die. And I'm always like, whenever that happens to Kurt or Kirk, I'm like, oh, that's brutal. It's like, okay, let's go from memory here. When you hear the word fellowship, you think what? <sighs> Meatloaf. Well, I mean, what do you think? When you hear fellowship, what do you think? Come on. What's that? <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Yeah, today, good. Lunch. Thank you, sister, for being honest, right? No, Southern Baptist, we do. We hear fellowship and you think meal. Where's the food? It's got to be somewhere. Somebody's eating something. <laughs> oh, they were so, we can, we can reread this. They were devoted to eating. Eating. It does talk about breaking of bread. Maybe that's what it means. Uh, I don't think so. The word you know, it's koinonia. You've probably heard it a thousand times. Um, it means so many things in different contexts. But what I think it means here, and Paul develops this a little bit later in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, um, he talks about an intimacy. And so when, when you think of fellowship, I want you to think of intimacy in the context of family. That would be a very simple and yet I would argue very biblical way to understand it. Its normal definition means to share with someone in something above and beyond the relationship itself. That's good. I like that. To share with someone something beyond the relationship itself. Going beyond, right? Um, it certainly means to strive together. It means to commune together. But I think underneath it here in what what. Luke, I think, was talking about is that the fellowship they enjoyed was a radical, spirit-led intimacy. So an example, I, I told Kate and I was going to use him as an example. Lori said to me the other day, she said, it's so great having Caden at church. She goes, because he's my nephew, I get to hug him and I get to kiss him. I get to say, oh, I love you. And I said, and it should be like that with everyone else. It should be. And she didn't disagree the intimacy that we enjoy in a, in a family ought to be even more so in the church. We're going to get to that. We're not there now. But that's the fellowship he's talking about. Radical, spiritually led intimacy. Do you have that? You say, I, I don't. I want that. You should want it. It's a beautiful thing to have that type of brother, sister, I love you. Come up and you know that they're real. They're saying that. And Lori said, you know, we've known Caden. I mean, obviously, we were there at the hospital when he was born. So we've known Caden for 17 years, literally. In the spirit of Christ, even if we know each other only for a month, there should be greater intimacy than that in true fellowship. They were devoted to it, which means what? They were consistent with it. It was a priority that shaped their lives. It was an other-centered work. 
right? They were committed to it. Same things you are devoted to in your life. Breaking of bread. Three possible interpretations. What are they? The which meal? Which, which meal? What's that? So the Lord's table, one, I'd say yes. Two, they called them love feasts, the agape meal. They ate afterward, just like us. Third interpretation, I think they're all right, actually. Third interpretation, in the homes. Hospitality. They were gathering, and they were eating each other's food. So they were breaking bread. Why was breaking bread so important in the first century? And I would argue should be important today. Well, what was the big deal about breaking bread? When someone said, I broke bread with my, my brother, or I... What do, I, what do I do with that? Good. So really important. The breaking of bread revealed two things. Intimacy with the person you ate with and acceptance. When you ate at the Lord's table, these were people who were saying, we are saved by grace. This is our body. We are intimate and we are accepting. When you bring someone into your home, even today I would argue that there is a degree of intimacy. When you bring someone into your house and they sit down at your table, there's some intimacy there. In fact, I would argue as well that that means of grace grows intimacy. We had the blessing of having the Avalas over for dinner. On We didn't eat them. They had dinner with us on Friday night. And when I came, Mandy came out of the bathroom today. I'm like, hey, sister. You know, there, it, what was different about it? Well, we just had a meal together less than 48 hours prior. Hanging out in the house, eating food, great dialogue. And so when I saw her, there was that, hey, that's my sister. Yeah. That's not theologically deep, but it's relationally real. That's what happens. They were breaking bread, expressing their intimacy towards one another and their approval with one another. Now, it's so profound. Remember that group, that 3,000. These were people from different places, different languages, different cultures. Jews, yes, But from the diaspora, they're coming from all over the place. And what were they doing? They were gathering like-minded, but totally different people. Super cool. Number four, they prayed. Um, I don't know how much this season needs to be elaborated on. They were devoted to prayer. They were certainly devoted to liturgical prayer in the temple. We know that. But most of the commentators argue they were also devoted to praying together in their homes. These people gathered together And they prayed fervently. One commentator said this, God's family then, the family of people did not work by feelings. Listen, (laughs) how profound. 2,000 years, same problem. Did not work by feelings or intuition, but by actively submitting themselves to the Lord's direction in community. They gathered and they prayed together fervently. They were devoted to all these things. So what do we understand then about the apostolic teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer, if it says they were devoted to them? What do we know? These means of grace, what do we know? They were devoted. What do we know about it? Just throw some things out. Did they take it haphazardly? Was it a joke? They were what? Serious. I I like that word a lot. They were serious. This was serious business. They wanted to hear the apostles and submit. They wanted to truly have intimacy. And so someone said, here, they had to to work at it. I mean, it's hard enough with people that are your own blood. They were serious about their prayer. They were serious about breaking bread. What else do we know if they were devoted to these things? They did it daily. Wow. That's a brutal one, Pastor. Kept talking about arrows from the pulpit today. That just, why did they do it daily? He said, well, they were all stuck in Jerusalem. They couldn't go home. Sonia. Don't we? Hebrews chapter three, verse 13, right? Gathering together daily that their hearts might not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
they knew, I think far better than we, we go Sunday, maybe we grab a Wednesday, we're in isolation most of the rest of the week and we think this is okay. That's not okay. That's not even remotely okay. Now that's the version we have in our cultural moment. I get that. But we gotta push way beyond that and say, hey, I gotta, I gotta be meeting with some more people. I gotta get into a small group. You and I gotta have coffee. We gotta have lunch. I wanna care for you. You gotta care for me. I wanna make it to the end. They were serious about it. So what was the result of this? Next slide, please. The results of verse 42 are what's described in verses 43 to 47. And I want to look at them very, very briefly. Because I, I, I do want to get out of here on time. I want to honor that. They were in awe. Now when we think of that, it's really interesting. Verse 43, if you look at verse 43, it says, And awe came upon every soul. In fact, I think the NIV translates this in such a way that the awe was a result of the many wonders and signs that were being done through the apostles. I don't think that's the best translation. The awe in the Greek is where we get the word phobia. It was fear. Not fear as in trembling, but fear as in awe and wonder at the reverence and majesty and power of God. What were they in awe of? What were they seeing? What were they experiencing? What's that? They were experiencing miracles, but that wasn't the emphasis. What were they experiencing back in the first four things? Authentic community. They were seeing something and experiencing something that they had not known. Feeding off, submitting to the word of God. Engaged in deep prayer. Having intimacy with complete strangers closer than a brother or sister biologically. They were in awe of the work God was doing through the Holy Spirit in their lives. Now as we work through these, before we close, I would argue that every single one of these we want here. I would argue you want this in your life. Ah, uh, sharing, how did they share? How did they share? Verse 44, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing them, the proceeds to all as had need. Now I don't, I don't have time to go into this dialogue in the context of Marxian theory. It has nothing to do with it. What we do see though, and I'll do sharing and burying together, they were so tight knit by the Holy Spirit that they, those who could not go home and many could not go back, not immediately anyway, many didn't want to go back, they thought the Lord was gonna return initially. They stayed there. But they didn't have jobs, they didn't have a place to stay. And so the church, what did the church do? The church got them employment, it offered food, it offered housing. And so they were able to stay together, they were able to share and bear one another's burdens, which we're gonna look at on Wednesday night. So be here on Wednesday, we're gonna talk about that very practically. They were able to share and bear one another's burdens. In other words, they were practicing community with their things. With their things, all those that had need were satisfied. They were gathering, verse 46, day by day, attending the temple together. They gathered, they broke bread, they prayed, they listened to the teaching. They worshiped God. They worshiped God, praising God, verse 47. And then the testimony of the world, having favor with all the people. That wasn't just the church. That was everybody that was around. And the result at the end of verse 47 is what? The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Imagine for a minute if someone asked you to describe Cambrian Park Baptist Church. And you said, oh, I was there on Sunday. Awe, sharing, bearing, gathering, worship, testimony, multiplication, unbelievable what the work of the Spirit is doing. Authentic community. That's the result. That's the product of people being devoted to the word of God, being devoted to intimacy, true fellowship, being devoted to real breaking of bread, not just a little piece and then that's it, but I mean in the homes, in our fellowship hall, and then being devoted to prayer. We need more awe and wonder in our churches. We certainly need more sharing and bearing of the load. 
in our churches. We need more gathering, faithful gathering, more worship, more testimony. And God, God's the one who multiplied. You notice that Dr. Luke doesn't talk about all the great strategies the apostles came up with to grow the church. They didn't have a, an evangelism campaign. What did they do? They were devoted to the means of grace that brought God's blessing. And the church grew by the thousands. Okay. Uh, any questions up to this point? I got one small exercise I want you to do and then we're, then we're done. Have I thoroughly bored you? Next slide. E either in your mind or on my mother's pad, she has plenty of paper there, she can give it to the church. She can, she can share if you are not having it, she can express having all things in common. Um, I, I want you to answer, I want to talk about this briefly the last five minutes and try to get an understanding of where you are and where we are. Of the four, the apostolic teaching, the word of God, fellowship, intimacy. So don't think meal, think intimacy. Breaking of bread here and in our homes and then prayer. Which of those characteristics do you, are you devoted to most? Which are you devoted to least? And then I want you to give me a reflection of the church. And again, you can't be wrong on this. I I'm, I'm really would like to have an idea of where you think we are. Where does the church do best and where do we struggle? Okay, so take a minute or so and jot that down or log it into your beautiful brain. All right, let's, uh, let's do the first one. Share with me, of those four areas, means of grace devoted to that cultivates or results in authentic community. Give me some hands and tell me where you are. So this one, so I'm not devoted to any. Which one are you devoted to most of those four? Brandon, which one? Gathering and, Gathering and worship. Okay. So that would be under fellowship? Okay. Kirk? The word? Devoted to most. Remember, devoted to the word of God, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. The word. How many, let's, let's do this. How many of you would say the word is the thing you find yourself, of those four, you're devoted to most. Raise your hand. The Word of God. Okay, about 40%. How about prayer? Okay. How about the breaking of bread? Breaking of bread? Good. How about fellowship? Intimacy? Good. So we got a good splattering here. That's good. I mean, that's good. Um, if you're devoted to the word of God, the others will come, right? You can't say you're devoted to the apostolic teachings and not pray. You can't say I'm devoted to the apostolic teachings and not break bread or have fellowship, right? So hopefully those of you, the largest number said I'm devoted most to the word of God. Hopefully that's where you'll see yourself going. Um, let's, let's skip to the church. How many, how many of you think the church is doing best at the word of God. Raise your hand. Doing best at the teaching, the preaching, the word of God. 
How many of you think the church is doing the best at fellowship? Christina? Good. Uh, way to support it. All right. How many of you think the church is doing best at prayer? Four, five? How about uh, the breaking of bread? <laughs> Christine, you can't do all four. You know that? <laughs> it says the most. You believe the most. Okay. Um, all right. Which one do you think we're struggling with most? How many of you think that the church, you probably, I'm, I, won't, well, I won't ask the first one because then you contradict yourself. You said the word of God, obviously not the word of God. How many of you think we struggle most with fellowship? Yeah. I, I, I'm putting my end up. I think so too. How about the breaking of bread? Yeah. Prayer? Yeah. Depending upon your understanding of prayer. Um, we so, I so want this to be hopeful to you. I want you to begin, and we will, as we go seven more weeks, looking, pulling apart, trying to understand the power that comes through authentic community. You know, the older I get, the longer I serve in the gospel ministry, the more I realize that I can do nothing apart from the Holy Spirit and very little apart from the body of Christ. Nothing apart from the Holy Spirit and very little apart from the body of Christ. We are made by God, intertwined by God to live as a community for God. That's how he made us. So if we do not approach that or strive for it, all we're doing is moving against the grain of what God has so decreed and created in this beautiful family we have here. And it is a beautiful family. I'm always in awe of what God has done in our lives and how he's brought people here. Questions? Any questions up to this point in time? Any comments about this is crazy doctrine? Got anybody? He's out. He's a socialist. <laughs> Dad? Well, the family environment isn't the best that it could be compared to what it used to be. The head of households. And you mean our, our, our individual families? Individual families. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you guys could hear that. I know that you probably could not on the tape. Um, the Puritans understood that the health of the, of the church would be contingent upon the health of the families. So as our families are not healthy, the church will not be healthy. As, the, as individual families do not reflect biblical familiar relationships, that's going to spill over into the church. I would argue as well that the church, in its authentic community, will strengthen the individual families. We'll be able to model and to love in such a way that we'll breathe life into broken marriages and into difficult parenting situations. Good. Thank you, Dan. Yazzie? Good. It's just too good. I got to write it down, sister. Yep. So that's, it's really, the, so what, we have a new creation indwelt by the Holy Spirit, making a new family and people for the first time experiencing their true identity. And so they were in awe and wonder because what they were experiencing is how they were supposed to be overcoming the brokenness of sin. That's great. Super good. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be gluttonous for awe. I am. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm gluttonous for the awe of God in my life and in the life of our church. I think that's one thing that you cannot be inordinate over. Awe and wonder amongst the brothers and sisters at Cambrian Park Baptist Church. You say to your friend, come and see the awe and wonder 
You got to see it. I can tell you about it, but you got to see it. Yazzie. Yep. Good. So appropriate for Hebrews 11. Last question, and then I'll pray, and we'll, we'll, we'll gather again on Wednesday. Your experience in the church up to this point in time probably has not modeled Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. You've tasted it. You've gotten experiences here. And I would say maybe more here than in some other places. But if you're like me, you read that and you think, oh, I want to get there. Um, We're not talking about perfection. Luke was not describing a perfect church. He was talking about and describing a spirit-filled church, which, according to the word of God, we can be too. That's exciting. It excites me. <laughs> All right. Any other, any other questions? I'm so thankful for you being here in the time that uh, you've given me. Um, if you can be here on Wednesday, we're actually going to be, for the next eight Wednesdays, I'm going to be taking probably a mutuality command. There are 31 in the New Testament or something. I'm going to be taking like the top eight that I want us to look at as a church. On Wednesday, we will discuss and then practice burden bearing. All right, so do some working out this week so you can throw some stuff on your back and you can carry. Pastor. Yeah, that would be burden bearing. For me, it would be. All right, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us here and opening up your word and showing us, Lord, the possibility of a gathering of people just like this being spirit-filled like that church, like your church, your first church, at Pentecost in Acts chapter two. Um, we, we know, Lord, that nothing's impossible for you. It's not impossible for you to overcome our isolation. It's not impossible for you to overcome our selfish desire to live alone, to be autonomous. It is very possible for you to show us the beauty and the majesty of a community of believers saved by grace and bound together by your spirit in a local body just like this. And so I ask that you would do that, Father. Bless us immeasurably to that end, that we might enjoy it and that you might be glorified in our joy. In Jesus' name, amen.